What the heck is this? A book with the title Ireland, Ur of the Chaldees, but was it Anna Wilkes? So we're wondering will what is contained within this book inform us that the patriarch Abraham, who was born in Ur of Chaldea, or Chaldea, also known as Babylonia, Mesopotamia, wasn't born there at all. He was born somewhere else. Even though it's stated in the original ancient very old tale of Asherit, Old Testament Brita or Genesis that the patriarch Abraham was born there in Ur of Chaldea or Babylonia and as the modern Americanized English Bible versions translations will say the same thing so let's explore this particular book to find out if it's going to tell us something very different to the biblical scriptures. Erata. Preface. The material that has engaged the author's attention in the following pages or this particular person in the following pages is principally taken from the Mosaic, the Quran, Talmud and Celtic references to the first peoples and places. As far as possible this person had avoided loading the subject with technical terms and problems to be met with in anthropology, a science necessarily contributing considerable matter to the text but have preferred to use it in to use in its history tradition folklore and other interests that go towards a proof that the first human families must have migrated from the west of Europe to Asia and not from Asia to the west of Europe that doesn't seem right if biblical scriptures say Basically, the Garden of Eden was well, had these four rivers that broke into tributaries or heads and flowed around eastern lands, the uh, Tigris, Euphrates, Gishon, and Pishon. It does not sound right. This may appear strange to some people, but it will occur to the reflecting and intelligent mind that it is quite possible to do over again some of the work of scripture commentators and interpreters and be at the same time in perfect harmony with the Bible for instance the sites of the principal countries cities and places mentioned in that book are by their own confession up to the present unascertained therefore the necessary the necessity existed for reconsidering the teachings of men as distinguished from the lessons of the Bible, which for the writer's part are accepted as correct and veracious. Veracious? Veracious? In the following pages there is no allusion to the doctrine of independent development, but they admit that human beings multiply from a first pair, or a couple, i.e. Adam and Eve, right? Be it a mitochondrial Adam and Eve, or Adam and Eve according to Genesis. As far as this person knew, they had not offended the prejudices, prejudices of any people or creed. In making much reference to the first inhabitants of the British Islands, there has been an endeavour to show that a great deal of the past, the prehistoric as well as the historic past, is marked by their actions. From this, it is advised that their descendants, as well as those esteeming themselves of Saxon, Danish or Norman blood, should remove the race asperities that so frequently operate against one another and join with the cult in mutual respect and prosperity. Because thousands of years have passed away with man at the correct register of his first existence and efforts here, so, like others, 
but not in a general way. This writer had felt or felt obliged to labour and to particularise and bring together out of the confused yet evident relationship of primeval man the similarities of his thoughts as they are written, of his speech as it is known, and of the signs that endure from his chisel and pen. How the writer has succeeded in this is now to be judged by us, the critics, right? His or her critics. It may be the task that the writer's undertaken will appear to them too difficult for the grasp of woman's mind. That it has been difficult, Wilkes willingly confesses, and perhaps the pages will indicate this more than she was conscious of. They are, however, the product of years of reading and reflection, and as such have been thought worthy of publication. Whether this book be or not, this book be or, n or not be successful, and its success cannot be reckoned by its completeness, there are such quantities of light material yet unused, that it will be at no distant date drawn upon and put forth in a periodical. The author couldn't allow this volume to go to the world without expressing his sincere and heartfelt acknowledgments to different people. Uh, okay, so her husband's constant reading of biblical history, his profound and unalterable faith in that book of books, had enabled the author to supplement, to illustrate, and to enforce her convictions on the subject which she had undertaken. Whilst her husband's devotion to the cause they both had at heart rendered his suggestions doubly valuable and more than doubly welcome. Anna Wilkes, Upper Norwood, September 1873. She may still be living today. There's no demise date showing. Introduction. Perhaps nothing is more characteristic of the present age than the advances made from all quarters in the cause of truth. Dogma, as well as theory, is subjected to the investigations of the thoughtful, and nothing is allowed to pass as true without bearing its full complement of laudation and abuse. Facts often make their appearance with unwinning surroundings, and it is not until they have stood their proper time under examination that they are admitted to the confidence of the knowing. They are then often fondled and make slaves of their admirers for the secrets extracted from them. So it is that, within the memory of men, new sciences are forming and are accepted from what were considered at one time but dreams and ridiculous speculations. But if we suffer, we grow wise with time. There are notably among the discoveries we may say of the present age such representative words as anthropology, eth no, ethnology and philology, kindred sciences, each of which, while possessing great interest for the ordinary reader, makes it compulsory upon those who lay claim to superior education to be at least acquainted with them. From the minds of wealth worked by the lovers of these sciences is collected much as contained in the following pages. If we shape our own fabric out of them, in it will be found nothing to offend those who follow truth or for its own sake. While respecting the beliefs and prejudices of others. The subject proposes that the locality of the Chaldea of Genesis has not hitherto been discovered, and that it has not been proven to have ever existed in the East. Well, we again are going to uh, debunk that, because the original ancient Tav Asherit, Ishana Atika, sacred scroll of the language of God, spoken by God, uh, Brita actually states that's where it is because the uh, river of water that ran through the Garden of Eden which split into four four heads or tributaries basically ended up running around certain geographical locations or countries to be uh, in the Tigris and the Euphrates ran around or ran through 
the Near East, Mesopotamia, Ur of Chaldea, Syria, etc. So yeah, we decided we'd not we'd disagree with that statement. Those who consider it as having been in the East attach themselves to an era that dates probably from the period of the first migrations of the human family. Okay, so we are yet to see proof on that. How? Principally because men, families and tribes of men removed in time and place and manifesting their moral and physical nature through fear or courage, in defence, offence, spirit of aggrandizement, self-assertion and from the influences to the motive of their existence, seeing in other families and tribes separated perhaps from the time of their first dispersion, enemies and encroachers feel most things but not the truth of their common origin. So to each opposing people the directions taken over the continents, the settlements made and civil prosperities created by each, or perhaps the kingdoms and civilizations they became aware of, or traded with, or assailed on their way, are for the most part lost to the knowledge of each. What knowledge cannot give, idea supplies. Its procession through the mind is grand and imposing according as the cause was great. If great, it has power of inducing awe and presenting itself in grand assumption, pointing to the exact country inhabited by primeval men, the language they spoke, what their religion was, and conjures up everything necessary to the seeming of truth, and the obligation of recording events and things. Like stars looking through the majesty of night, the elements of truth sparkle in idea and give spread and consequence to its creation. And to know ebullition of fancy so much as that which forms around the truth of man's first existence, his locations and wander on earth to another existence. The fact is, mankind has been long persuaded that in the east was contained almost all the scriptures, scripture sites, wrongly interpreting what we are told in Genesis that the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel and Erek and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shina and that Asher went out of that land and built at Nineveh. Okay, that would be probably... What is it talking about? No, it's Jacob. This one came later, right? Asher, he was a king. We're pretty sure we're correct here. Went out of that land and built at Nineveh. Has assisted more than anything else to make this believed. But nevertheless, it has always been a complete mystery where Sheena... Where was Sheena? It's Sumer, Sumer, isn't it? Which is in uh, that Mesopotamian region. Assyria. Desert region, right? Mistaking the situation of Shina made it necessary to find Chaldea and other countries either in or near it. Thus, Shina is supposed to mean in Hebrew, as shown in our pages, further on this book probably, something like two rivers. Or two rivers. The significant Signification, no doubt, was found because it was thought it must be near or between the Tigris and Euphrates. But even if the etymology be admitted, it is an unsatisfactory explanation of the position of so important a place as we must believe Shina to have been. Shina, to the commentators, is often only a convertible term for Aram, Naharam, and Mesopotamia, which bear an interpretation between the rivers or the country between the Tigris and Euphrates. As to Chaldea, the name has no meaning in any of the Semitic tongues. Well, we'd have to ask a Aramaic-speaking, uh, native-born Aramaic-speaking translator about that, whether that's true or not. They refer, this author refers to the earnest inquiry to their text for full information on the state of the question. And here's a contents page. Chapter 1. The extent of Chaldea. Its situation not in the east. And Mr. Rawlinson cited, he's like a archaeologist. Perhaps he found um, a lot of Assyrian artifacts, cuneiform tablets and so forth. Just like Henry Laird and his friend uh, 
uh, Muzd, his assistant. Sheena is Europe, according to this writer. Chaldea is in Western Europe, ref reference to the religion of the Chaldees. Ur of the Chaldees, reference to Ireland as Ur. quite a lot of contents Ireland Ireland Ur of the Chaldees chapter 1 the extent of Chaldea its situation not in the east and bringing before the readers attention the extent of ancient Chaldea Chaldea, in which was Ur, according to the best authorities, we do so in order to show that it was of such small dimensions as not to have contained the cities and kingdoms commonly supposed to have been within its areas, its area, and therefore that the district or country of Chaldea was not between the Tigris and Euphrates. Perhaps the best authority that has appeared lately, or when this book was written, that period, on this subject is Mr. Rawlinson, who wrote the Five Great Monarchies of the Ancient Eastern World, who has been quoted extensively in the notes to the new edition of the Bible and elsewhere. We give from his work, page 14, a passage on Chaldea. It is obvious that the only natural divisions of Chaldea proper are those made by the river courses. The principal tract must always have been that which intervenes between the two streams. This was ancient, anciently a district some 300 miles in length, varying from 20 to 100 miles in breadth and perhaps average 50 miles, which must thus have contained an area of about 15,000 square miles. The tract between the Euphrates and Arabia was at all times smaller than this, and in the most flourishing period of Chaldea must have fallen short of 10,000 square miles. We have no evidence that the natural division of Chaldea here indicated was ever employed in ancient times for political purposes. The division which appears to have been so employed was one into northern and southern Chaldea, the first extending from Hit to a little below Babylon, the second from Nefer to the shores of the Persian Gulf. At each of these districts we have a sort of tetrarchy or special preeminence of four cities such as appears to be indicated by the words the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shina footnote indication there it's asterisk Genesis 10.10 10. his note is the sacred historians perhaps further represent the Assyrians as adopting the Babylonian number on the immigration to the more northern regions out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth, Rehoboth and Kalah and Rezin. Genesis 10, 11 and 12. The southern tetrarchy is composed of the four cities, Ur or Hur, Huruk, Nippur and Lhasa or Larancha, which are probably identified with the scriptural Ur, of the Chaldees. Eric, Kauna and Alasa is a footnote indication. In three out of these four cases the similarity of the name forms a sufficient ground for the identification. In the fourth case, the chief ground of identification is a statement in the Talmud that Nofer was the site of the Kana of Nimrod. And Sipara is the scriptural Sephavim. The Hebrew term has a dual ending. It's got two endings, more than one, because there are two Sipara's, one on either side of the river. The northern consists of Babel or Babylon, Borsippa, Kutha and Sippara of which all except Borsippa are mentioned in the scripture. 
Besides these cities, the country contained many others as Chumad, De Kuri, Gausu, Ihi, Ahava, Rebisi, Turan, Tal, Humba, and so forth. It is not possible at present, in the time of this being written and published, or written, to locate with accuracy all these places. It may be known, however, in the more important instances fixed, either certainly or with a very high degree of probability, their position. Her or Ur, the most important of the early capitals, was situated on the Euphrates, probably at no great distance from its mouth. It was probably the chief commercial emporium in the early times, as in the bilingual vocabularies its ships are mentioned in connection with those of Ethiopia. And for the location, and down the bottom here it says, Sir Henry Rawlinson in the Journal of the Geographical Society, volume 27, page 1. A five for reference. The name is found to have it been attached. Ah, the name is found to have attached to the extensive ruins now about six miles from the river, on its right bank and nearly opposite its junction with the Shat El Hia, which are known by the name of Mukhir or the Bitumented. And footnote indication states Mr. Taylor in the Journal of the Atlantic Society volume 15 page 260 Sir H. Rawlinson prefers the derivation of Umke the mother of Bitumen now the substance of all this is the, that Chaldea property was divided by the river courses or in other words lay between the Tigris and Euphrates and anciently a district some 300 miles in length and perhaps averaging 50 miles in breadth and that the other track between Euphrates and Arabia was 10,000 square miles or less than a third of that entire Chaldea calculated to have had an extent of 23,000 square miles falling short of Ireland by more than 9,000 square miles then Mr. Rawlinson in the wake of those who have written upon the subject before him, goes on to tell us of the probable situation of Ur or her, and that according to Sir H. or Henry Rawlinson, it was probably the chief commercial emporium in the early times. It is not to be wondered at that Mr. Rawlinson follows upon the beaten track of discovery in this quarter. It is far safer so to do than to search for a truth in a new direction, which, however, is enticing and affording abundance to gratify the thinker, the archaeologist and scholar. Handed down to us are etymologies of names of places, doubtful as the positions of those places. The word Shina suggests what is given as to as the Hebrew of it, nothing more. Shin to and Na or A, a river, so that's two rivers. Chaldea is rendered the country or dry land of Chazdim which word is no doubt derived from the Chasid, son of Nahor, who gave his name to the city of Nahor in Aram Naharaim. Aram Naharaim, Aram, between the rivers in Syriac, Beth Narim, or Beth Narim, uh, has the same signification. The Greeks from the Hebrew or Syriac consequently compounded a word with the same meaning, Mesopotamia, or the country between rivers. The Arabs knew it by the name of the island or Al Jazeera. Babylon in Greek, and in Hebrew, Babel from Balal to confound, which word is said to be contracted from Bal, Bal, confusion. There are other etymologies, but the latter are the most probable and have the advantage of signifying exactly the state in which the question is involved at the present time. Confounded and in confusion. We have given or the authors have given the author has given the above examples of ancient names or places because they are generally understood to mean the same thing. The country or land between rivers. The one exception seems to be the Arabic Al Jazeera, 
Jazeera or the island, how these interpretations may be otherwise understood than they are intended will be looked at afterwards and considered. They'll be afterwards considered. At present, in that particular time in this book being written, it is obvious that the best scholars are undecided as to the correct meaning and geographical position of Shina, Chaldea, Aram, Naharayim, Mesopotamia, Al Jazeera, or even Babylon. They have looked in vain through the notes to the new edition of the Bible and thought, as they believe most people would, before risking a conclusion to this to so important a question, that the great intellects engaged upon that work would, would have evolved something tangible from the many hypotheses that have been constructed in defence of a locality for these most important scripture places. The authorities for the new edition of the Bible have simply quoted from the best writers upon the subject. To Mr Rawlinson they owe a great deal, but he unfortunately has left the question much in the same way as he found it. This is what was to be expected. For all the misapprehension but the question has originated with the interpreters of the Bible making Shina, Chaldea, Aram, Naharayim, Mesopotamia and Babylon one place and this principally because the words have a like me. Kala is confounded by Rawlinson with Kalne. In Genesis 10.10 10, it is stated that the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad and Kauna in the land of Shina but in verses 11 and 12 of the same chapter it is given out of that land went forth Ashu and builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Kala and reason between Nineveh and Kala besides Kala and Kalne there is a Kauna quoted by some authors as the same place there is nothing very strange in supposing Asher to have been the builder of Kala Kala and Kalneth Kalnet were not the same place. Kala, it may be allowed, was in the district claimed for it by Rawlinson, but that Kalnet was not there, it is sufficient to know. Asher went out of a land called Shina, of which Kalna was Babel, Erek, and Akkad was the beginning. Asher is described as having got out of Shina and built the cities of Nineveh, Rehoboth, Resin and Kala. For the situation of these cities, there's ample evidence. The beginning of the kingdom of Nimrod should be understood as distinct from the building of Nineveh, Kala and other cities in Assyria, attributed to Asher. Interpreters of scripture mislead by often only a supposed meaning of the Bible names. Is there a footnote indication here? There's a footnote at the bottom it says so probably the Al Ras of the Quran simply means the beginning. So for the situations of those cities there's ample evidence. The beginning of the kingdom of Nimrod should be understood as distinct from the building of Nineveh, Kala and other cities in Assyria, attributed to Asher. Interpreters of scripture misled by often only a supposed meaning of the Bible, names of places which they had they find in Chaldea or Chaldea, Hebrew and Greek Chaldea must be the language and misled also by their anxiety to find all the beginnings of things in the east had mistaken the testimony of the Aboriginal or the indigenous language of Europe indigenous people's language of Europe or tribal and the countries over which it was spoken that language admitted by philologists to have been before Greek and Latin and coexisting with Sanskrit, the language that gave names to most of the mountains, rivers, the natural scenery of Europe, and bestowed on parts of Asia cognate words that endure yet almost unchanged, the Celtic. If those interpreters had availed themselves of the light shed by the Celtic languages upon the pages of the Bible over which they laboured, they would not have sanctioned the huddling together of so many countries and cities in Chaldea, a place not to be found even in name in the whole Hebrew Bible. Footnote indicator, it says down here, as before stated, Chaldea is rendered, maybe that's in the Hebrew, Arts Chestim, the country or dry land of 
چشتیم If it is our duty to seek the best means of proof, it is necessary to divest ourselves of prejudice while thinking over that book that contains so many truths about our first state and our future life. Chapter 2 Remarks on the sons of Noah and their tongues Where the habitation of Noah was after his descent of Ararat has not yet been discovered at any rate satisfactorily but we are informed it was a land in which he planted a vineyard, according with him being a husbandman. His son, after living with him for a time in this unnecessary or unascertained locality, an unascertained as the eastern resting place of the ark, separated. Of the descendants of Japhet, the older son, we are told they occupied the immense extent of land that stretches from Asia Minor immediately south of the Caspian Sea, the river Oxus, the Aemus, Eamus, and Ate Mountains to the extreme east and north of Asia. For no indication. Why they may have gone over to America from this or some other point is a matter that does not come within the range of the present argument. Although it cannot be treated upon here, it is related to the subject to their subject of the descendants of Japhet the oldest son we are told they occupied the immense extent of land that stretches from Asia Minor immediately south of the Caspian Sea, the river Oxus, the Eamus, and Ate Mountains to the extreme east and north of Asia, and westward over Asiatic and European Scythia, Scandinavia, Britain, Gaul, Italy, Greece, all the Mediterranean islands, and into Asia Minor again. By many, it is thought the west coast of Asia Minor, or Dodenum bordering upon a Tarshish which they include with the island of Cyprus on its south in a Japhetian chart. Shem's descendants are supposed, are supposed to have inhabited all the land south of the Eamus and Ate Mountains to the east and north as far as Japan, southward over the Pacific Islands, Hindostan, Persia, Syria, Assyria, the country of Aram, and then with the exception of Dodana, and the supposed Tashish, the remainder of Asia Minor. The descendants of Ham are assigned to Arabia and Africa. The names of the sons of the generations of Noah can be traced as having been peculiar to Western Europe before Christ. The whole earth was one, of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shina, and they dwelt there. Genesis 11, 1, 2. Of course, it must be concluded from this that the sons of Noah were of one language and one speech. Yeah, that's the uh, Lishan Atikas Sapaya, the sacred scroll of language of God. Uh, they spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden. And the minute the Tower of Babel, Prior had spoken one language, which the native born Aramaic translator, Victor Alexander, from Mesopotamia. Syria says um, that those men at the Tower of Babel spoke the Shanaitika Supreme, the sacred scroll of the language of God, before they were given multiple languages and then scattered across that Near East geographical location. Not the whole world at this point. They dwelt in Shina, all these men, etc., dwelt in Shina, which country was in the west, for it is expressly stated they journeyed from the east. Yeah, they probably, it was like Adam and Eve, right? They're in the garden, then they get ousted out because they sinned, uh, so they got pushed to the east, right? 
and then Kane kills Abel he gets banished by God and he's ushered down the, the certain part of the garden to the east uh, and so forth right the first human beings these pre-Adamics that God had made according to the Tab Asherit the original ancient very old Tab Asherit Old Testament Brita uh, they were told to go multiply increase etc and they went east well it doesn't tell you that but that's the hint right you look at the old maps uh, supposedly are where the Tigers the Euphrates uh, no sorry uh, where Eden's supposed to be right located and you have a look at it and like if it's one giant landmass, okay, if you're gonna go up north, you're gonna end up in the sea. You go west, you might end up in the sea. You go south, you might end up in the sea. So it feels like, or we're assuming that they keep getting pushed to the east, to the east, because the river that flowed through the Garden of Eden to water it, or the vegetation, etc ends up sp being split into four heads or tributaries which go around certain lands and two of them the Tigris and the Euphrates either went around those two future countries or they ran through it so if people eventually like move to the east of Shina etc etc like that well then they're going to occupy those lands in the east aren't they they're not going to the west, which is um, Mediterranean, Greece, Rome, etc. And that's why they're called Easterners, not Western Easterners or Eastern Westerners, yeah? So you can conclude that the sons of Noah were of one language and one speech and that they dwelt in Shina the descendants did anyway which country was in the west no it's incorrect we don't believe that for it is expressly stated they journeyed from the east that's what we're talking about they're going, coming from the east moving into some other geographical location which is still in the east yeah and then moving further on still in the east it might be the far east right? but still the east in what part of the west from Asia or Shina if it did not extend over all Europe okay so it's saying it's that whole region Geograph geographical location that's what she's saying we will leave to the reader to determine from the facts as they are given in our subsequent pages within this book for the present we safely assume that the sons of Noah spoke one language what that language was may be a difficult question to answer correctly well, we just gave you what that language was, the answer to that. But difficulty should not deter us from at least searching for it among parts that once made a whole, made one language before it affected others. Notwithstanding the arbitrary classification of languages, philologists are becoming more aware of this fact. It is quite possible that time and observation will reward the independent searches after truth and bring together through them so many at least elements of the matrix tongue spoken by the sons of Noah and for a time their descendants as will forever set at rest in solid foundation the materials of the primitive speech we are aware of the gravity of such a task and that it requires volumes to do it justice if we devote a few suggested pages to this subject it is because they may be found necessary to the explanation of the text and of service in discovering a European location of Shina the laws of language and the names of those laws were first discovered by the Greek philosophers and grammarians. Yet so is may be gathered from a passage in the Kratilos 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 of Plato that acute minds could not do more than suggest that the barbarians lent some of the words to Greek the idea of penetrating the relationship of languages probably never entered the head of Plato. It was reserved for the thinkers of the century to take the first step towards the classification of languages. 
The stupendous mass of speech used by man is at this hour as difficult a task to divide into distinct families as any that can be conceived. The Aryan Semitic, the Indo Chinese, the Malayo Polynesian, the polysynthetic dialects of America and other tongues have not at present yielded much toward the philosophy of language. But as far as researches have been conducted, the Aryan and the Semitic have contributed most. Under the Aryan are completely uh, comprise the languages of India, Persia, Armenia, Greece, Italy, the Celtic, and Slavonic. The Semitic includes the languages of the Babylonians, the Syrians, the Jews, the Ethiopians, and the Arabs. If we judge of the influence of these two classes of language upon political and literary history, we admit they include the most important of, this earth, of the earth. But inasmuch as it can only at present be conjectured what was the first and natural state of language, so is there much tendency to err dividing into the classics. Thus the Sanskrit and Hebrew, the Celtic and Arabic are not only to be studied as Aryan and Semitic languages, but as languages that must have reciprocated many of their parts. A hundred years ago, this would be considered visionary by scholars accustomed to look up Hebrew, Greek, and Latin glossaries for the radicals of various and dissimilar words. But their labour in that way was unproductive. They accepted as necessarily true what had been taught them, nor believed that there might be much darkness dispelled in some things important to the elucid of language discovered in the histories of people and nations in the records of their manners and customs in relation to present manners and customs their names of places and things remaining in modern languages the wars of people and nations their contacts their associations peace and mixture of race the civilization and by the monuments of civilization and decay man in his normal state had a vigorous language uncircumscribed by rules. Max Muller, alluding to the Aryan and Semitic speech owing their origin, origin to historical concentrations of speech, wild and unbounded, says, was said, in the eyes of the student of language, Sanskrit, Greek and Latin, Hebrew, Arabic and Syriac are what a student of natural history would not hesitate to call monstra, unnatural, exceptional formations, which can never disclose to us the real character of language left to itself to follow out its own laws without let or hindrance. For that purpose, a study of the Chinese and the Turanian dialects, a study even of the jargons of Africa, Polynesia, Melanesia is far more instructive than the most minute analysis of Sanskrit and Hebrew. There's a footnote indication right there. Uh, so, reference, stratification of language, page 10. Although, the historical concentration by which was formed a wild unbound Aryan and Semitic speech the languages of most parts of Asia and Europe cannot be written in detail we may arrive at an almost certain conclusion that such a language became the basis of the Zen, Doric Old Sclavonic, Latin Gothic, Armenian, Lithuanian perhaps Sanskrit. For all varieties of one type and perhaps no one of them can be considered as the original on which the others altogether formed who can say from what words grew in diverged dialects and languages. It is a certain it is certain it is certain that the Sanskrit even although approaching so near to a matrix language has not preserved in many cases the primitive and organic forms of words to be found in Greek and Latin. This is held by many scholars scholars. Max Muller gives an example that your not too short that actually is cannot be derived from the Sanskrit smas because smas has lost the radical a which Greek has preserved the root being as to be the termination mass e a we and it continues the words above in different languages from English Slavonic to Isaiah uh, Irish the above from Max Muller are only a few of the words used by the first of the Aryan stock. The lingua presca of the first inhabitants of Italy was nothing more than a dialect of the primitive Celtic. In course of time, this dialect received infusions of Greek, uh, 
uh, particularly a Olic 3D features from the Peloponnesus the creek itself meantime retain much of the ancient Celtic upon which it undoubtedly grew as from one extensive route that spread itself everywhere over Europe and he continues on with that Max Muller again it is given because of the great authority of Max Muller at the same time it is to be regretted that he had not a better acquaintance with the Celtic language etc etc these are all the Several different languages in their meanings for cattle, ox and cow, ox, steer, and the different columns. Okay. Talks about the languages. This is English, Irish, Chaldean in Hebrew ok words in script by the looks of it chapter 3 Sheena is Europe really? the way being now to our mind clear of the principal objections urged in support of a radical difference between the Aryan and Semitic languages it becomes our task, or the writer's task, to show how the people of Shem, Ham, and Japheth may be traced in prehistoric Europe, and to point out that Shina is ascertainable to have been Europe and Chaldea with Ur er in its western quarter. Mm, not too sure on that one. As before stated, Shina, according to scripture interpreters, is the country round about Babylon, the great plain or alluvial country watered by the Tigris and Euphrates. Yeah, we we believe that. As it's written. Sheena round about Babylon is an unmeaning is as unmeaning as the presumed Hebrew etymology of the name to river. You can see page five. Okay, for to clear that up. And has no reference to the land it is supported to signify. It is slightly different when we interpret arts chest the name for Chardin uh, in the country or dry land of Chasdim Chasdim nearly the same may be said of Aram Naharam which we are told means Aram between the rivers and also of Mesopotamia as to the meaning of Chaldea we are left to we are left entirely in the dark neither Chaldee nor Hebrew lexicon nor the learning and ingenuity of men and for the indication, perhaps we strain to a, a we strain to a conclusion in this respect for its meaning in Irish as a preserver of fires a cold day from Carl Kyle seal to burn some give the meaning of seal a servant gil the modern form of gilly is more likely to be the signification Signification. The peoples and kingdoms referred to in the Bible according to this writer and supposed by commentators to be in the east are actually to be found in the west they are not to be found in the east it shall be our effort to show that this uh, writer also would show this right that not only the Celtic tongues and literatures but the histories of distinct nations point all in the one direction and that the materials of modern science are daily contributing to the proof of prehistoric Europe being a seat of many places and people mentioned in Holy Writ or texts. And then these writers 
abilities also states that she would strive to remove the anomaly that became there is a small district in Asia that because there is a small district in Asia this an island by 9,000 square miles nearly surrounded by two rivers that therefore Sheena, Chaldea, Aram, Naharam, Babylon, Mesopotamia and a host of other important places must have been there we will bring the writer would bring to bear more direct evidence and support of the position which she and her husband hoped or team hope that the readers would remember is Sheena being Europe could not possibly be situated round about a Babylon that was neither an island nor a part of one in the east well we're still uh, debunking that one we're not too sure on that one chapter 4 Chaldea is in western Europe reference to the religion of the Chaldees the first Chaldean was a Faxate or a Pasquate in the original Aramaic reader. The religion of the early Chaldean shepherds must have been that of Noah and his sons. Okay, we'll agree with that. The Chaldean religion was so called must have affected the Hebrew. Yep, we'll go with that. Up to the time as well as after the sons of Noah became Chaldean and Hebrew, megalithic altars and sacrificed by fire and prayer with signs of faith. Don't know about that one. Didn't Abraham uh, have his eyes on the one true God? Just the one God? The remains of the great Chaldean nation can be particularly distinguished in Great Britain and Ireland, and these remains have special reference to the religion of the Chaldean in Hebrew. The signification of signification of the world of the word Kalne, which was a place the same as Kalno of Chaldea will assist to illustrate this. The first part of the words Kal Ne, Kal is sometimes varied in Kael, Gal, and Seal, or Kiel, each of which means in Irish to burn. It has no meaning in Hebrew more significant of fire. Sometimes by metonymy, the same word means a stone altar, which is sufficiently indicated by sacrifice by fire and smoke, and continues with the words and language explanation in the Hebrew etc 